the Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, FIL Responsible Entity Australia Limited, AFSL 409 340, ABN 33148 059 009 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hello everyone, Jamie McIntyre here. This ensemble series is all about the great wealth transfer. Throughout this series, you'll get insights from planners in our community and the team at Fidelity who have produced significant research on the great wealth transfer. I'm sure you will enjoy this series and get a greater understanding of how you can help in the great wealth transfer. Fidelity has been investing globally for their clients for more than 50 years and 20 years here in Australia. With one of the world's largest investment research teams, they conduct more than 20,000 company meetings each year to uncover unique investment insights that others may miss. Fidelity offers a range of Australian, global and regional managed funds and you can also access their investment expertise through our active ETFs on the ASX. Invest with local insights, powered by global strength. Hello everyone, welcome to today's podcast. Uh, My name is Jamie McIntyre and I am your host. I'm a 25 year financial planner and specialize in retirement advice. I'm looking forward to today's podcast and sharing with you all the insights from research that has been completed regarding the great wealth transfer in Australia and how you can be better prepared for it. We have two guests today, Simon Glazier from Fidelity International and Inban Devadasan, our financial planning guest. A little bit about Simon. Simon is Head of Wholesale Sales at Fidelity International. He has 20 plus years experience across financial services. He joined Fidelity in March 2020 and is responsible for leading the sales and distribution team efforts of Fidelity International across the Australian wholesale market. In today's podcast, Simon is going to share with us the insights that Fidelity have uncovered in their research around the great wealth transfer in Australia and the opportunity for not only clients, but advisors and how they can help. Welcome to the podcast, Simon. Thank you, Jamie. Happy to be here. Great to have you. Um, a little bit about Inbam. Uh, Inbam is our financial planner guest, and he is an author, father of four teenagers, and the owner of Sydney, the Labradoodle. His favorite child, he tells me, though not hard giving the other children to teenagers. Inbam is a qualified actuary with over 30 years experience in the financial services industry with the past 18 of those years as a financial planner. Inbam loves to travel and has visited around 30 countries around the world with some of the highlights so far being Zanzibar, Marrakesh and New York. He loves variety and has lived in seven cities. Uh, Currently he's in Melbourne. Uh, His second favorite place, although his wife uh, prefers Melbourne, and uh, thinks it's the best city in the world. And I'll check in with you, Embalm. What's your favourite city? Um, I grew up <laughs> my school years in Perth. So Perth is my number one city for, for definitely for growing up. Uh, yeah, great part of Australia. Um, Embalm is passionate about providing financial education to anyone who will listen and tries to help clients and friends to make wise financial decisions that will give them financial flexibility into the future. Inbam is a firm believer in the transformative power of personalized financial planning strategies and is the founder and director of Precision Financial, a business which has been offering holistic, multi-generational financial advice to clients for the past 18 years. Welcome to today's podcast, Inbam. Great to be here with you, Jamie and Simon. Yeah, we're looking forward to a great podcast today, but let's kick off with you, Inbam. Inbam, tell us about your experience as a planner and the importance of bringing families together and setting expectations about wealth transfer. Thanks, Jamie. Um, We focus on um, clients in the 45 to 60 age range. So maybe I'll give that as sort of the context. So typically uh, a couple coming in, uh, obviously, yeah, normal fact find information, but we're keen to understand, you know, their overall family situation. So we're keen to understand, you know, uh, that couple, um, parents, siblings, children, 
potentially grandchildren, you know, the full picture. And obviously we capture some of that in the fact find. And certainly in the fact meeting, we're trying to just understand those relationships and where people are at um, to think about the bigger picture. And and obviously, you know, they might be getting an inheritance down the track um, and they also might be looking to, um, to give a gift to, to children down the track. So we're trying to get that big picture up front. Certainly one of the things we talk about is their goal in terms of um, the couple, how they would like to help their kids. So some say, look, they want to help with hex debt if that's there. <laughs> some say they want to give a, a gift of maybe 100000 to each child to help them or, or a loan. So we'll, we'll sort of tease that out just to see what they're thinking currently. But then we'll also share with them what other people at their life stage are doing so that they can, um, if they haven't thought about it too much, that's okay. Uh, We can start to tease out what's possible and then over time we'll refine what's right for them. Yeah, great stuff, Imbam. So listening to that, you look at all clients from a very broad lens, no matter what their age are, they're a potential receiver of money. money. Uh, They're also a potential giver of money. Yeah, look, look, absolutely. And, And look, in that conversation, because of that target age range, that 45 to 60, you know, typically somebody's got a parent in their 80s or 90s and will you know, have that longevity conversation and, and, and you know, we'll, we'll, they'll start to talk anyway about, yeah, you know, uh, oh, my dad's passed away, my mum's in this situation or this person's in aged care. Um, within the practice, we have an aged care specialty as well. Um, so if we can help in that area, obviously that gives us the opportunity to say, look, when uh, yeah, a parent needs some help, we can guide and, and, and that's a nice little um, yeah, entree just to sort of let people know where we can help in future situations. Yeah, nice stuff. Simon, Fidelity's done some great research, um, particularly the document called The Rainbow's End that uh, Imbalm and I have, have had a good read of. Um, tell, give us some of the insights from your perspective from The Rainbow's End research. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. And good start, Imbam. Uh, I think it's a really important conversation and given the research really backs it up in terms of that engagement early on with those that are interested in in passing on a legacy. And, you know, really the crux of the research is driven by a survey of 1,500 Australians over the age of 27 and just some high level kind of points. Four in five of those participants over the age of 27 believe sharing their wealth with the next generation is important. Three in five feel it is their responsibility. So there's a slight difference there, right? If a majority of people in this survey feel it is their responsibility, it really needs a different approach and a different acknowledgement, I think, from those that are there to help and ensure that 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 happens. Um, And it's interesting in terms of the cohort, the age cohort, what we found through the survey as well is there's differences in in, in absolutely different age groups uh, and the way they think about legacy, both being a giver and a receiver, but there's also cultural differences and and a recognition that that legacy is more is more often than not more than just more than just money. Sometimes it's a feeling of or wanting a feeling of gratitude to be passed on. Sometimes it is supporting an educational, as you say, uh, you know, hex debt. Our first uh, thought was that a lot of this three and a half trillion dollar trillion dollar wealth transfer will go down to be to pay mortgage debt, but it is so much more complicated, complex. Than that, in particular, when uh, when a large portion of the expected legacy is people's superannuation savings. Yeah, yeah. look, I think that um, a part of that research, Simon, and the expectation that uh, the majority of it will go to pay to pay down mortgage debt. I, I think that's likely, um, but it's also a pretty straightforward answer to a survey as well. If if we explore that a little bit. Um, and it, and Imbam could maybe give us greater insights into what happens before it shifts down that pathway to just paying off debt. What's your experience, Imbam? Yeah, sure. And and this is the interesting part of of the research and and, and what's happening is, um, I think maybe twenty thirty years ago, um, most of the wealth transfer happened as as somebody passing away an inheritance. Now I think it it, it can. The wealth transfer can happen over fifty years, and let me let me explain that a little bit more. So, what I'm seeing is, um, you know, clients that we have in their fifties, sixties, seventies, they might start by saying, "Look, we want to set a 
set up an investment account for all of our grandchildren. So, you know, there's $10,000 each for, you know, the seven grandchildren, you know, that, that sort of transfer is where it starts. Then it might be, look, um, our children can't afford to send our grandchildren to private school. We're going to pay for some or all of the private school fees. So it's already starting, you know, at, at, at that stage. Then what I'm seeing is, um, you know, uh, there are some clients who really they need all of their wealth to meet their retirement needs. And that's fine. And we'll flag that to them. We'll say, look, there's not a lot of opportunity for you to help, help your kids, but here are maybe some ways. And, and, and we just try to help them be realistic about that. If I just go to the other end of the spectrum, you know, clients with a large asset base, um, you know, they're often looking to provide, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollar gift to kids to help them get into their first or second property, that sort of situation. But now I'm seeing a next stage. So I've got one client I'm working with at the moment where, you know, they've got an estate of more than $10 million. And so what they did was they did the first gift to each of their children, two children, 250000 and that's got them into their first home. That's fine. Then their children are now in their 40s and they're ready to do the big home upgrade, you know, the big family home. And so in one of their children's situation, they want to help more so that they can buy a property for the long term. Otherwise, they might need to do it in a staged approach. And so what they're going to do, they're actually going to co-invest a million dollars with the with one of their children um, to help that them buy that long-term property. Now, we've spent a lot of time with them exploring many options before we came to that conclusion. So, so it's often about canvassing ideas and saying, look, what's the need here? What are different ways we can play it? Um, you've got to think about, you know, if, if a relationship breaks up, um, you know, having a contingency plan there. And so we've arrived at something for this particular situation, working with the lawyers that that will work well. So so that's the breadth from a, a simple gift to a grandchild to um, multiple gifts, maybe for property um, to, um, you yeah, know, obviously the, the, the big transfer at the estate time, which could go to pay off a mortgage, um, could be held in a testamentary trust and, and those sorts of discussions. Um, yeah, that's sort of the range we're seeing, Jamie. Yeah, that's pretty broad range, your mum. And look, I've experienced things like that and and those types of conversations as well with our clients. So I think what I've experienced is is a lot of it around um, making sure is not the right word, but you know, a lot of education with me as the planner around different things to think about. Um, some of those education pieces are around, okay, well, why don't we start with your children and, and, and do some work with them and understand what their spending's like or their savings like and, and, and help them teach good habits. And we found that's been really important for the giver and the living giver um, in those examples you're giving around giving money whilst alive. Um, to to give them the confidence that those funds are going to be used for good things or wealth creation activities or, or debt reduction. Yeah. Um, have you experienced similar things to that? I, I agree with you, Jamie, there. Um, what we look to do with, with, with our existing clients is we sort of flag to them, look, when your children get to that typically 18 to 25 age range and they're either getting part-time jobs or they're getting their first graduate type job, often... They don't know what to do. You know, they'll just park money in cash, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so we offer all children of clients and where clients don't have children, their nieces and nephews are, are able to take a free education session, um, each one of them. And so we use that education session um, to just basically say, look, these are some of the money habits you need to be aware of. Obviously, spend less than you earn, invest widely, um, make sure you've got some insurance as the backup plan, you know, some of those sort of principles. And then we'll do some education around all the different asset classes that are available. And we'll more importantly talk about time frame. So if they want to buy a car in two years' time, obviously they need to be conservatively invested. If they're looking at a deposit in seven years' time, then they can take a, a longer-term perspective with investments. So we do that education piece purely as education, um, but then we'll say to them, look, um, as a practice, we do mortgage broking, we do insurance, we do financial planning, we do you know, looking after the, the older people. So we'll say to those children, look, when you do get your first job, um, come and see us and look, we'll, we'll make sure you've got some income protection in place. And if you do need a savings plan, um, we can help you with that. And then we'll say to them, look, by the time you get to the point of buying your first home, we can help you with the mortgage broking. So education, what do you need now? What might you need in the future? 
Yeah, great stuff, mate. Well, Simon, from the from the research and based on the research, what's your thoughts around how we can uh, embalm lent into talking about the younger generations and some education? Uh, based on the the research, how do you think we can educate the younger generations? Yeah, I was just having a couple of thoughts there, Jamie and Imbalm, and and you know, one one is on the view from the giver, um, and this is probably a mix of the survey, but also my experience, but. If we think about communication, because you're engaging and communicating with the next generation, right? Uh, around seven out of 10 baby boomers say it's extremely important to have open communication, particularly around a legacy. Now, again, my experience isn't necessarily um, positive on the ability of baby boomers to communicate. You're talking about my parents and so on and so forth, and they've come from generations of probably not communicating. So this is a real opportunity, I think, to engage and communicate with th- with that next generation. And And... Throughout the survey, it was obviously through a, um, a generational lens as well. And from a Gen Y perspective, you know, when they're answering the question, if you were to receive significant financial help or inheritance from your family, where would you rely on advice for what's best to do with it? And by far and away, the professional financial planner was the top response. So Gen Ys actually make great clients. One, I think because they've already experienced their parents' and maybe their grandparents' quality of life in retirement because of a financial advisor, or they understand the the complexities of of life, particularly when you throw dollars in the mix. Yeah, so there's a couple of things there, uh, which have which yeah, again were reflective in the in the survey and the research, but uh, I think important points to raise and and link into what Iman was was sort of talking through there. And that's potentially the advice gap too, Simon. I um, what, the wording that was used in that was it. Yeah, I think you said seven out of ten baby boomers see it as important to communicate, but not necessarily they are communicating. And I think that was overlaying with your personal experience, uh, similar to my personal experience. My parents aren't in a hurry to communicate about those things either, and we've got a. We've got a really good opportunity as the intermediaries or the person sitting in the middle to bring all that together, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. That is the gap. When people think it's important but don't know how to do it, that's where they need professional assistance for sure. Yeah. Your thoughts on that, Embarn? Yeah, look, I agree. Um, a lot of clients do find that hard, the communication of even what they're thinking and and sometimes don't really talk about it that much as a, as a couple. So, um. So I've got some clients who who do it really well. Let me talk to you about an example of somebody who does it really well, and then I'll go to the other extreme. Um, so a couple with three kids all in their 20s now, um, they've been pretty clear to their kids um, when they were um, in late high school that, um, you know, do the what they want to do, um, we will pay your hex bill stage one, and they communicated that to them. Um, and, 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 and that was certainly a relief. To, to all of their three kids. And and that meant that their kids could save at quite a fast rate, you know, knowing that they haven't got that, that sort of hex burden. Then as they were in uni, they did the next stage of communication and they said, look, um, what we're also going to do is we are going to give you, you know, a gift as it happened. It happened to be 250000 each um, when you're ready to buy a property. So what that meant was it sort of helped their kids set the time frame in which they could get a home. They're all in Sydney. So it might have been beyond 30 before they got into their first home. But then they suddenly knew, you know, once they graduate, if they push hard with a graduate role, you know, maybe late 20s, they might be able to get into the property market. So so that early communication is important. Um, and obviously, you yeah, know, they're, they're treating all their their um, their children equally, which you'd expect, but obviously different people do different things. Um, so yeah, so that's an example of good communication. And probably one of their things that they want to do down the track is when this couple's parents give them inheritance, they will actually probably pass it straight down to their kids because they don't need it. They're in a strong enough financial position. And that will be their next level of communication when they get to that point. And they're the good communicators. Let me give you an example of, of somebody who was a little bit shy in this area. So um, it was a couple with two kids. Um, we were about to do the investment education. They also wanted to give a gift to their kids, but they were a little bit uncomfortable talking about the dollars and giving the gift and that sort of thing. So they asked me as part of that education to do the education for the kids together. And as part of that, 
to mention to them that their parents have in mind to give them a gift of this magnitude, um, and if uh, and and so to keep that in mind, you know, with their own personal planning and 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 buying a property, and then the parents were happy to discuss that with the kids afterwards. Just wanted that intro to be done by me in that context. Um, so that was interesting. It's the first time I've had that request, but that actually has worked quite well in that particular family situation. Yeah, great work, Imbam. What I what I heard then in in my summary was there was a sequence of events um, in both cases. It, it required a level of engagement um, from you uh, and and potentially pointing out there some blind spots um, and things to think about. And the second piece was the education piece as well as connectivity, connecting everyone together on on all of that. Is that a, a sort of the sequence you follow? Yeah, Jamie, look, that's that's a really good summary. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, nice one. Uh, I think from hearing, hearing your response there, as well as previous responses, it's really important to engage all members of the family to avoid those disputes. Correct. Absolutely. Having the conversations early and, 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 so one of the things we are focused on in our annual review, um, yeah, some clients do take a while to do their estate planning, um, but one of the things we talk about every annual review is, um, do you have any questions on the estate planning that's in place? Or if they don't have it in place, we'll have a conversation about the importance of it. Um, and so that has been good. We've had good success in the last 10 years of people actually finally getting around to it. And we have in, we work across Sydney and Melbourne, so we've got uh, referral partners in Sydney and Melbourne. So if they don't have somebody to go to, we'll encourage them to go to their family connection. But if they don't have somebody to go to, we can certainly introduce them to somebody who can help them. And make them more likely to go and get that done. Absolutely. <laughs> Simon, talk talk to us uh, back to the rainbow's end and the, the handle with care section. Talk to us to some of those statistics about um, uh, uh, top ways to address those potential conflicts from the research. Yeah, I mean, as you were talking there, Imbam, I mean, we haven't extracted necessarily conflicts from the survey, but definitely recognise that one in two of the respondents have experienced at least one scenario that have complicated matters in the process of estate planning. And we're talking about financial insecurity among family members, so people at different stages in their wealth creation lifestyle, the decision around the equitable distribution of the legacy, you know, if you've got a dependent that's in need of more, how is that viewed by the other dependent? So the default was was primarily an equal distribution, which isn't always necessarily the right thing. You know, estranged family members, blended families, disabilities. The point there, though, is that a large proportion of respondents, but also Australians, experience something that changes the discussion or changes the financial plan or deviates it from what was originally set. So this, this um, and, and we, we know it does happen, but this constant reviewing and checking in versus the current state is really, really important. And the other thing that sort of teased out from the survey was that historically what had been in the realms of the family office or the complicated family with a wealthy kind of establishment is is really in demand from everyday Australians now. And you mentioned it there, you know, the the trust the different trust structures, the bloodline, testamentary trusts, all that kind of stuff is now, I think, better understood by by us as Australians. And that's probably where, you know, combination of making that happen, but also finding simpler and 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 more educational approaches to allowing that to happen in the family. A family unit. I mean, yeah. I might ch chime in there. Um, Go for so it. You, you mentioned about the um, yeah, equal distribution, you know, potentially. I had one one interesting story that I'll share. So a client um, in their 70s now, um, four children, um, and two children had done very well, you know, good incomes, all of that sort of stuff. Two hadn't done so well just because of health issues and, and other things. Um, and the parents um, were keen to be equitable and, you know, in their wills and put 25% to everybody. Um, but they decided to have a bit of an individual conversation with the kids to, to, uh, to say, uh, as couples, you know, the four couples, um, uh, to, to just talk about what they're thinking and that sort of thing. Interestingly, the two couples who are well-to-do basically said to, the, to their parents, um, we are actually quite happy for us not to receive anything or a smaller share or whatever. 
And so that was actually really nice for the parents to know that, you know, they didn't mind that situation and therefore they could go a different route that actually probably brought a, a better outcome to all four children in that sense. So that was the only one of those situations I've, I've seen, but it was an interesting conversation. And to Jamie's earlier points, it really was about, you know, that open conversation early to be able to, you know, do this while everybody's, you know, in good health and, and can have that conversation. Yeah, I think um, uh, the words equal distribution is a really interesting concept, really, in a way for parents. I was thinking about my situation. I have four children uh, from age 13 down to seven, and there is no such thing as equal distribution. There is no such thing as fair well, if, if, if I'm the person making all of those decisions. And I, I thought it was a great story that you just shared there, Imbalm, about what's uh, what I would I would think about in the words of equal distribution and fairness for a family unit, which is talking to all parties and figuring out what's you know what what's good for everybody. Um, fair, fair is a fallacy, and if everyone's unhappy, you've probably done a good job. Because <laughs> if one person is happy, well, they've obviously been you know at the lion's share. But yeah, you know, one other thing I'll probably tease out and and. This is also goes back to some other research that we've done in terms of what makes a happy life in retirement. You know, just under one in five thought it was important to look at implementing strategies, investment strategies that align with your family's long-term goals and risk tolerance. So in other research, we've talked about the retirement risk, sequencing risk, inflation risk, et cetera. But if you're talking about a legacy, well, then the approach to portfolios and investment strategies may may differ. And it was just interesting that that was recognized through the survey. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, we uh, day to day when you're working with uh, husbands or uh, couples or individuals, uh, you do address all of that in a significant way. That's the, that's very interesting to come out of the survey that um, everyone's leaning into their family values around risk profiles and investor profiles. Just heading back to the uh, rainbow's end again, Simon, and in the challenges to overcome, which which references, well, it's more in the context of the estate planning and on the assumption of the actual estate. Um, there's some pretty interesting stats there. Um, it talks about the top estate planning complications due to life scenarios, um, which which overlays the things that I think that Imbun has figured out with a few of his clients in the examples he's used today. You know, one of the biggest complications is financial insecurity amongst family members. Um, and, and it was great to hear Imbam. I won't say sold that Imbam, but you brought that to a much better place uh, with that example that you had with the four children and the distribution of that wealth. And there's a few other items in there, Simon, around emotional vulnerabilities among family members. Imbam, have, have you experienced those with... Um, well, not as not as able is one way to put it in the sense of understanding um, the financial wealth of their family. Um, look, many families have uh, a child with special needs. Have you have you had any experience with families with special needs? And and that probably puts a weighting of the distribution differently for for families with that um, to work through as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, look, certainly have some existing clients where they do have that that situation, um, and certainly in recent times, at the moment, obviously things like the NDIS and the funding, yeah, in terms of support, have been you know quite quite critical. Um, haven't been in a situation where we've sort of set up a, like a disability type type trust sort of situation, but certainly um, I can see it, yeah, already in the discussion on clients' minds in terms of what that means for the future. And more importantly, you know, even things like who will be the carer going forward and, and some of those those sorts of roles and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, Imbal, as the advisor and you've built your practice to be able to support a lot of these needs for your clients, sure. um, there's probably plenty of smaller single platters out there that are developing and growing their business um, and growing their client relationships, but without, without maybe the skill set just yet to uh, dig deep enough and ask all of these questions and uncover that work and be able to do it. Um, what are some of the things that you've done along your journey to upskill yourself, um, to be able to deliver the support that um, family units need to um, to be able to provide this service in, a, in, a, in quite a holistic way? 
yeah sure no that's 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 a really good question um so um so i think a, a business network is important so i have been part of bni and fresh network in the past um how those networks work is you either meet once a week or once a fortnight you know with different professionals from different areas particularly accountants and lawyers and mortgage brokers and and, and that sort of thing um and so you develop relationships with those but aside from that each of those professionals take turns to do a 10 minute education you know on on what they do how they help clients and that sort of thing and so i think that is useful you're yeah, having a professional network not only people that you can refer to but people that you're learning from um and so look i'm not an accountant but i i like to have good knowledge in that accounting space so that i can guide and say okay go and speak to your accountant about this but here's some principles to be aware of um so business network really really important um where you can align yourselves and and have other support so if you're a planner that doesn't do insurance advice you know to have somebody you can refer to we do do that in-house so that's fine but yes having that insurance partner is important look i think the the debt and mortgage broking discussion is really important again we do that in-house more as an add-on service for existing clients more than anything else um but again having if you don't have that no problem but have a an, a, an alliance with somebody who you can refer to, somebody who you can talk to to say, look, in this situation, what's the borrowing capacity so that you can share that with your clients. So it's just having pe professionals you can talk to, to be able to guide um, and that sort of thing. The other thing that we do with our ongoing service, um, we include, as, as most people would, the ability for us to talk to the client's professional network, whether it be accountants or lawyers, we'll just do that as part of the service. And so having those three and four way discussions where that's relevant is really helpful because the financial planner, the accountant, the client all come from slightly different perspectives. And when you bring all your perspectives together, I'm finding that we can just get a better result for the client. Yeah, I, I experience the same in Barn when you're able to connect everyone together. And in particular, from a financial planner's perspective, we're so well trained in, let's call it soft skills, but, you know, on the emotional intelligence side and, and digging in deep, and it's been a big focus for our profession for, for quite a while. It's not necessarily a big focus for those other professions, and it's a significant element that we can bring to those meetings, isn't it? I agree with that, actually. That That is true. Yep. Yeah. And another thing to, another summary of, I think what you said there, Ian Barb, was um, you need to get out there and become a connector for your clients. Don't hold back on asking these significant questions around the great wealth transfer. Go out and, and create that network, that professional network, that trusted network um, to, to help your clients through this wealth transfer journey. Yeah. Look, absolutely. And if you look at all the different players, um, we really tend to play that role of connecting all the dots. And so therefore that adds that responsibility of, of, of sort of having both the connections personally to those other relationships, as well as understanding their perspectives. Yeah. And the best interest duty brings it all together for us. Absolutely. <laughs> Simon, have you got some things that you'd like to add from the research perspective for today? Well, only probably just some references, but just thinking about what Emben was talking about there, looking across the generations, the propensity and level of interest and willingness to learn. Gen Y, again, 80, 85% of Gen Ys were interested to learn more about their personal finances. So to your point, it's not just about the financial planner, it's about the debt, estate planning. You could throw all those connectors in there. And from a Gen Y perspective, they've got a high propensity and a higher level of interest than other generations. Even baby boomers, only 51% were interested to learn more. Uh, so again, it's a reflection that Gen Ys make make great clients. And and the other excite, the other interesting point, we talked about communication preferences. Across the generations, in-person meetings is still the preferred way to engage. Yeah, and that's, that's our experience as well. And really what the survey is telling us is the demand is there and it's it's quite big um in bob for our listeners uh, who are mostly financial planners tell talk me through you don't have to expose your your fees and your fee structure but tell us about the thinking that you had to do to get a fee structure right to put you in a position to ask these questions dig into these areas and have a business model that works around working with the the broader family unit 
<clears throat> yeah, look, really, really good question. Um, so, look, what we've done is we've decided we we are going to be holistic in, in our advice, and and really we prefer clients where um, they're just going to get the holistic advice. We don't like to do a subcomponent, you know, of of, of their advice because it, it's not the best for, for everybody. Um, in some cases. There are reasons where you do that, but 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 we really try to be holistic, and so yeah, we're we're pricing in that holistic sort of manner. So uh, talk you through the process because that sort of talks about the filter. So the filter is look typically we'll be getting a referral from an existing client. They make contact in some way. Um, we'll we'll do a phone call or ideally a fifteen minute Zoom, and that is that is complimentary. Um, and it's really that normal, you know, get to know each other. Obviously, understand what their advice needs are. Can can we help them? And so. Yeah, we really are using that 15 minutes as the two-way filter, if you like. Um, is, there, is there a fit? Yeah. All of those sorts of things. Then the next stage, if they do want to go to the next stage, that the, the normal discovery meeting, we do say it's 75 minutes to just give us enough time to discuss all the things. Um, before that discovery meeting, the commitment from them, they have some fact-find information that they need to give us. I give them a little checklist of things they need to have. So that must be there five days before the meeting for, for the meeting to happen. Um, we do charge a fee of 330 for that meeting. Um, and it's more a, a filter more than anything else um, at, at that meeting. And so the people who are, are serious about discussion will obviously come to that meeting. They will come prepared, which is important. Um, we spend roughly the first half of that meeting um, teasing out their fact find to really dig deep to just understand a bit more behind it. You know, the home, the investment property, what are their short, medium, long term plans for each of those properties so that we get a sense of, you know, are they uh, are they assets that are staying in the picture or are they assets that, that are, they're looking to, to, to get rid of? In which case, obviously, there's a whole lot of other things that we can do, but just understanding what their their base case is. Um, and then at that meeting, the second half, we actually present the advice scope as we've read it. Um, if, if it needs to change, it can. We, we present the advice scope. We estimate the, the benefits of the advice to them. Um, and we show them what the costs are for the upfront advice and the ongoing service. And we say, look, it's a 12-month engagement upfront plan and one year's worth of ongoing service. At the end of that 12 months, you decide what you want to do. Um, look, our retention rate is 99%, but we do indicate it's just a one month engagement um, and we, we go from there. Now, what we do is we obviously price the relationship and we actually then have a fixed 3% indexation, but we flag to them if their wealth, if the wealth that we're managing for them materially grows, then that will be a reprice point. So we're staying up front, you know, it's this fee plus 3% every year but there will be reprice points down the track. So we flag that to them so that there aren't surprises along the way. Yeah, so what I heard you say there, Imbam, was it's really important to have a pricing structure in place. So whether consciously or subconsciously, you know you're getting paid to ask those questions and dig deeper. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and so we're targeting our pricing structure around that 45 to 60 group. Having said that, because we too do mortgage broking and we do do aged care advice, our clients are from 18 to 90, so we, we do manage everything. And so we sort of have the subgroups, you know, there's the 45 to 60 group, there's the 35 to 45, there's the under 35. And so we've sort of got our pricing set for each of those life stages um, because the complexity tends to vary with the life stages. Good stuff. Thanks, Imbam. Um Last last piece I'm going to have a conversation with about in today's podcast um, is cultural considerations. The research talks to cultural considerations. Um, every culture is different and has different needs and different requirements and different expectations. Um, Imba, we had a chat prior to recording today and we had a conversation about some of your experiences uh, in the cultural space. Tell the listeners a little bit about some of your experiences. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, look, Jamie, I think you're right. You know, each culture is a little bit different. And that's one of the nice things in that 15 minute conversation in the discovery meeting, some of that comes out, you know, when people fill out their goals, you understand, you know, are they a completely property focused family, which is fine. Um, uh, are you, are they completely share based sort of family? Um, you know, have there been trust in the mix, you know, in the few, in the past and all of those sorts of things. So I think in those early stages, we get a good sense of where they are. Um, so look, I am Sri Lankan by background. Um, we do tend to find that people 
um, of the Asian and subcontinent um, uh, backgrounds, yeah, property tends to be a, a big a big focus, um, and sometimes to the detriment of superannuation. <laughs> um, and and so you know we'll have that conversation up front to say yes, yeah, property is a good long term asset. You can use borrowing to add value to that. Um, but we'll say you, you, we also want to do things tax effectively. So, um, so we will, we will understand where they want to focus and we'll help them focus on that area. Um, but we'll also give them opportunities to go into other areas, um, where, where we can. Yeah. With a little bit of focus around different educations and different reasons and drawdown reasons, et cetera, to help them understand well, potentially their cultural biases in some ways, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and Jamie, to that point, you know, um, in the accumulation stage, you know, having debt, having negative gearing on a property, no problem. You can meet the cash flows, um, depending on a client situation. Um, you know, obviously once they're retiring, the income return from investments becomes so much more important. And so we'll have that conversation five years before retirement to say, look, we think we need to rebalance where we are over the next five years. Um, because you need more income in the mix. And so that that can be done in a stage manner because um, your change like that can be quite hard at times. Thanks, Imbarn. Um, Simon, uh, to begin our wrap-up, have you got anything you'd like to add from the research from Fidelity? Oh, probably just around some of those cultural differences that we found, you know, particularly of those with Asian heritage, uh, really felt stronger about the legacy supporting um, education and career development opportunities. But those with Asian heritage in particular were more likely to value career, family values and continuing family, we family wealth. Sorry, uh, And that's in comparison between Australian and Western, Western European uh, identified cultural heritage. And uh, unfortunately, the those with Asian heritage felt more of their responsibility to look after the next generation through the generational wealth transfer, but were more unsure of how to do it. Yeah, they were, in some ways they were conflicted on very much how, how, how to make all of that work. Guys, I'm very mindful of time. We've uh, we've had a pretty solid recording today, Simon. Um, thank you for for your insights today off the back of the research by Fidelity. It's really important that this research gets done, and it starts really good conversations like we've been able to have today with Imba. So thanks for today. Thank you. And Imba, I could have asked you many, many more questions, and I'm sure you would have shared with us many, many more insights. Uh, Imba, thank you for your insights today and uh, helping us understand how you work with your clients in the Great Wealth Transfer, and uh, thanks for coming on. No problem, Jamie. I'll just share one more thing, um, and that's just yep, top, top five tips for, for planners around wealth transfer and being engaged in that. Um, we touched on uh, we touched on the the topic of um, yeah, in person meetings rather than Zoom. Um, so look, when I started, I was using like a shared office, and I would often do home visits to clients um, as 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 the review meeting. I, I would encourage people where that is practical to do some home visits for their meeting because I find you you have a much longer conversation, you have a much more in-depth conversation, and you often get to meet the children. And so that's actually really important for, for later on. So that's my first tip, home meetings if it's possible. Provide an education service to the children of clients um, because that gives you that first opportunity to have a chat with them. And it just really does help connect the dots between uh, parents uh, and children. Sow the seeds uh, in that education meeting about how you can help those kids at different points um, in time so that they know when they, they can come back to you. Be part of the estate planning conversation with clients. So work with the estate planning lawyer, be part of that conversation um, so you can give your contribution to that whole process. Um, and even when uh, it gets to the estate, um, you know, give a quote to the executor to be part of um, helping them work through the distribution of assets. So they're just my top five tips. Awesome. Thanks, Imbarb. That's great value for all the planners listening today. Um, to wrap up, uh, this has been a great podcast hearing you both and thank you both for your contribution. And um, thanks again. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Jamie. 